Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, how this is set up is uh, I don't now see my speaker notes, so I'm, I'm winging it and hoping for the best. Um, you are at the Committee on the Environment. Something's supposed to happen here. Page mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Um, the second in our speaker series, Not Wasted, Transforming Post-Consumer Glass and Plastic into Local Building Materials. Um, Committee on the Environment, also known as COPE, is basically the uh, sustainability working group for AIA. And this is our mission statement. Um, as the local Pope, our mission is to bring together uh, essentially everyone across the building industry that's concerned about climate change and wants to know what we as the building industry can do about it. Um, and we set up the speaker series to encourage people to come and uh, get to know each other and, uh, and learn something along the way. Code is national, so essentially wherever there is an AIA chapter and interest, you can set up a code. Locally, uh, if you want to get involved, you can first of all just show up. That's always great. And then a um, couple of initiatives that we're working on. So coming out of our first event, which was a uh, uh, building deconstruction and salvage uh, presentation by Tony Bidham of the East Hawaii. Um, uh, interest in creating models that, that architects here could use. So if that's something that you're interested in engaging, um, get in touch with us. You can do that really easily by just replying to the invite that you got this call on. Um, and then we're also talking about having you may have heard of the solar decathlon about by the Department of Energy. Uh, we have been talking about sort of kicking around the idea of a carbon decathlon. So total carbon, not only operation carbon, which the solar decathlon is focused on, but also the uh, carbon emissions associated with building materials. And if that's an effort that you would like to get involved in again, please get in touch. And then uh, in the county, there is this um, climate ready Oahu effort that's going on. Um, if you go to uh, the online webinars for Monday and Tuesday, unfortunately that's passed. So now what they have are these in person events. And you can go to the website if you would like to find out more about that. So, yes, we are uh, have a lot in common with uh, our, our part, our code. Okay, I'm apparently a little quiet, so I'm gonna use this, goodness. Um, we are unique, uh, not only our geography, our history and our culture, and um, particularly when we're talking about building materials, being here in the middle of the Pacific, um, that's where it's some some challenges, and currently the vast majority of our building materials are imported, which led us to question, what are the possibilities for local building materials? And uh, we created this. Um, me is myself, I'm chair of the committee, I'm joined by Gail Suzuki-Jones um, of Hawaii Energy, uh, Scott Schwarzwalder of G70, and Matt Klein of Cosentino, and we put together this speaker series. I hope you're able to uh, join us for the remaining of, um, events of the series. Our speakers today are um, Paul Kane, who is here with us in person. Um, he's been in chemical and construction material sales and marketing for 30 years. He started with institutional and industrial chemical sales in the mid 80s and for the last 25 plus years has been a sales representative and product manager selling a wide range of construction materials and developed a number of products specifically designed for use in the Hawaii market um, from local and mainland manufacturers. He is the manager owner of Aloha Marketing Manufacturers Representatives 
um, formed in 1998. Aloha Marketing represents a wide range of products for the West Coast and Hawaii Islands and Guam. Uh, let's see, he is immediate past West Regional President of the uh, Construction Specification Institute, um, CSI, overseeing 11 chapters in the West. I'm not working. Um, Paul likes stand up paddleboarding, fishing, inshore and offshore. And he gets in a little golf as founding member of the uh, Kale Country Club in his Ocean Point neighborhood in Eva Beach. Hey. Welcome. Um, joining us online from the East Coast, where it is uh, quite late, is Patrick Grasso. He's co manager. Uh, managing partner of Urban Mining Industries, um, which is the company that manages uh, Positive, which we'll be hearing about today. Um, used as a cement replacement, Positive can reduce the carbon footprint of concrete up to 40% while providing large scale solution to the ongoing challenges that waste glass creates in our recycling system. And um, for those who are not aware, we we do of course collect our glass here and then it gets shipped off to the west coast where it gets sold. Um, so it's currently not being used on that. Um, positive is a potential use for that glass locally. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Paul. I think we're set. So a few years ago, um, through my business connections, uh, uh, one of my good friends in the main uh, asked me to do some consulting work for a group called Bifusion. Bifusion is based in Gardena, California, and uh, their whole purpose is, is to turn waste and turn it into infrastructure as far as uh, building materials. So as we all know, plastic is choking the earth and uh, <clears throat> we're drowning in it. And one of the key things here is Jill's bringing over a block. So we can all see a plastic block, but basically we were talking about uh, how we ship glass out. Well, we ship a lot of plastic out of Hawaii too. So ideally, it, what if we could take some of the non-recyclable plastics? You know, we only recycled uh, in the triangles, the ones and the twos. What if the three, fours, five, six, sevens all could be used in a building material here locally? So that's what we're trying to do with Biofusion Global. So the solution is taking that plastic waste and then putting it into our patented blocker system, which basically shreds up the plastic, steams it, heats it up, and presses it into a building block, a solid plastic building block with little nubs on top, much like a Lego. There are some of the uh, folks that have done some uh, reporting on Bifusion and what we have going on over the past few years. So availability, um, you know, we can make it 65% faster than regular blocks and lumber as far as bringing it to market, we can build faster. It literally is a mortarless system. So you're just basically stacking blocks over one another over galvanized rods for a post-tension system. So uh, very cost-effective for builds too. So when you kind of look at some of the attributes when compared to lumber and concrete, you can see the different advantages there. Um, you know, and going down as far as the reusable and zero waste and things like that. Also, you can look at, there is an acoustical rating. Um, you know, so if you look at um, the STT rating and uh, some of the strengths, the R values as well, so 
all this has been done. There's ASTM, there's an ICC report, and we'll be seeing the uh, Green Guard with you all. So different applications. Um, basically, right now, we're doing uh, sound walls and ADUs, um, furniture and benches. So that's what you're seeing in the pictures here. Um, that one little recreational pavilion was actually done on Kauai. And Hawaii is a very important part of what Bifusion does because of the amount of plastic waste that we actually ship out of the uh, of Hawaii uh, to the West Coast. So one, just make it real simple. You know, we collect the waste. We actually work with different um, folks like uh, uh, Sustainable Hawaii or Surfrider Foundation. There's all these different groups that go out and clean up and get the plastic, but needs to go someplace. And unfortunately now it goes in containers and gets shipped to the mainland. So again, trying to give it a place to go here and uh, avoid shipping. So once it's collected, the plastic shredded and then it's fused into by blocks. This is the blocker system. So it actually is a containerized system where we just need a footprint, a minimum of about 4,000 square feet, 440 voltage in city and county water. That's all we need to get going. And two containers of space for a three blocker system. But to do it, to make it make sense, and why when we looked at Kauai and outer islands, it doesn't make sense is we need 30 tons a month plastic. We're not gonna get 30 tons a month out of the outer island. So it needs to be based here on Oahu. If we're gonna ship plastic, we ship it to Oahu, not to the main. But then you look as you build up, I mean, we can go up to a nine blocker system, just increments of three and increasing the line. So there's a little cross section of it. Basically, one into the shredder, into the conveyor. It goes into the blocker unit and it gets steamed and heated up. So, <clears throat> monetizing the uh, unrecyclable. So, right now, this is all either getting burned or buried. You know, these plastics we're talking about burned or buried. Those are our options right now. So, this gives us, you know, a huge thing where we're getting away zero waste. You know, reduction of logistics and cost, like we said, shipping to the mainland. And obviously, our landfills only have so much space here on the block. So we got to limit what we're putting in our landfills. So here's basically how it works. Um, we would actually find the uh, plastic production and then actually get, you know, as it goes through the system, manufacturers, retailer centers, consumer use, and then it becomes plastic waste management. Then it's a matter of diverting that to a blocker system, making it into a block, and then putting it actually into construction, distribution, and into infrastructure. These work really good for sound walls. Just, I mean, you know, running down the side of the freeway or something. They're really nice sound walls. And you just go and put a stuff on them, and they work great. So a couple pilot projects. There was one here done in, uh, in Boise. <clears throat> And where they did uh, for the city and county, they did local elementary schools. So basically, we, you know, once we have market penetration, we have blocks available for sale. Then we can actually look at market penetration with different types of uh, builder installer training, and then we probably have like actually kits available to start with, you know, from benches and furniture to ADUs. In, in small things, you can go to your Home Depot and buy the blocks and the rods you need. Better put up your own delay to So different models as far as direct to market, you know, direct to consumer, direct to contractor, direct distributor. So we have to, working on capital funding to get up to be able to take on all this at the same time. And part of my job is helping with the market plan in each of these segments. And just having done what I've done, selling construction materials for 30 odd years and working with architects, engineers, and, and contractors, it kind of is just second nature for me to take products and bring them to market, especially if they're new things and get them introduced. So here's sort of the timeline as far as, uh, oops, let me go back one. The timeline as far as where we are now in 22, 23, we're a little behind that, but basically we're looking at corporate partnerships still. And uh, there was some stuff that came out recently that I'm hoping to be another announcement for the end of the year on uh, uh, some of our investment capital uh, partners that are coming. 
awards and recognition. So we're kind of getting it out there. We got some things going. We kind of been laying dormant for a few years. And that's because we kind of hit a point where we needed to get that capital investment and funding. So it's all been working about bringing in the money since 2020, 2021. Uh, Heidi is our CEO. Um, that's who I report to up in Gardena, California. Your contact information. And then this is the pilot project we did in Hawaii for this athletic pavilion um, over on Kauai. And Mayor Kawakami was very interested. You can kind of see here how easy it is where this thing goes together, where you're just basically have a simple foundation and you've actually have threaded rods coming out of the concrete foundation. And then you're just stagger stacking your blocks and they have knobs on the top of the blocks. So it's basically like stacking Legos. They have a compression plate at the top, squeezes it all together, drywall the inside, put a siding on the outside. You put screws or bearing strips or you can put up a mesh and just plaster over the walls. So it makes a thing uh, a pavilion like this. I almost guarantee you, if we showed this to you first and you never saw any of this, you would have no idea that's a bunch of plastic waste. Looks pretty nice, huh? So if nothing else, this is a great starting point for all the municipalities and some of the schools, the DOE, um, the city and county of each, you know, the islands. This is a great place to start as we get further along in development. You can get more structural things. We can start using this actually for homes and, and building some small structures. So some of the campaigns, that, um, there's some uh, very good videos and information on the YouTube channel for Bifusion. So if you put in Bifusion or Biblock on YouTube, you can find the channel and see some of that. Some of the reducing carbon emission um, numbers that we came up with <clears throat> as far as being involved with <clears throat> this, this program. Um, the natural gas offset, you know, renewable offsets certainly are kind of nice as far as not having to incinerate and landfill. Um, okay, that was my last slide. Any questions? Okay, very good. Right. Pass this back to you. Thank you very much. Here. And now we're going to hear from Patrick. If you could please share your screen. Patrick, are you good? Can you share? I'm, I'm coming. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, very good to be with you. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry not to be able to be with you in person uh, on this cold night. My wife is even sorrier uh, that we're not out there with you. So uh, again, thanks to, for, for inviting us, inviting me. I want to talk a little bit tonight about a, something, a, a product we're making called Positive, a ground glass Poslon to make low carbon, high performance concrete. Um, we're making it out of recycled glass. Um, we've been doing it for a while. Uh, it's proven, it's safe, it's sustainable. Uh, not only uh, does it create a high performance, low carbon product, but it also uh, is a significant solution for our unwanted waste glass. Uh, we opened a large scale plant here in Connecticut uh, in early 2021. By the end of this year, we'll probably have processed or converted about 150 million bottles, um, uh, repurposing them into uh, a ground glass poslon. Prior to that, we were making it in a small pilot plant upstate New York for 10 years. So I had a chance to see the market uh, with some projects that have been in place now for, you know, at this point for over 10 years, uh, performing well. The photo you see on the, uh, on the right is Hallett's Point in Queens. Those of you that have been to New York, uh, built by the Durst organization. Uh, first uh, high-rise structural tower to use ground glass poslon and structural concrete elements. The first tower in various uh, points throughout in a pilot program. The second tower with the entire foundation and entire four-story pedestal 
was all built um, with a ground glass uh, Poslon in the mix. Uh, I suspect most of you on on this call have a sense of what a Poslon is um, and the importance of it. Basically, it's a fine powder that by itself is not cementitious, but when you mix it with water, it becomes cementitious. Uh, you need them for making high performance concrete. Um, not only does it, this product create a low carbon, high performance concrete, but again, it's a solution for our unwanted waste glass. The photo in the middle is uh, what the product looks like after we're finished with it. Poslons have been used forever. The Romans and the Greeks have been using it for over 2000 years. Um, how does a Poslon work? Very simply, when you hydrate cement, you add water to cement, two things happen. Calcium silicate hydrate or CSH, the good stuff, as I call it, is formed. That's the, the glue that kind of, uh, that binds the overall concrete mix. And not so good stuff, the calcium hydroxide is formed. What's great about Poslons, and including glass Poslons, is that they're high in silica. They give up a silica atom. It bonds with the bad stuff, the, the CH, and it forms more good stuff, the calcium silicate hydrate. So that's really the magic behind a, a Poslon and, and why glass is so good. It's very high in silica and it's very consistent in silica. It's consistent about a 72% uh, level uh, in consumer waste glass. The three big issues we're uh, um, attempting to, to help with in our, in our country, uh, glass, uh, the concrete industry and the Poslon industry. Nationally, um, we probably consume, give or take, 12 or 13 million tons of, of consumer glass a year. Unfortunately, only about a third of it nationally gets uh, repurposed. The balance of it goes to landfill. Uh, in, in much of uh, in much of the country, single stream recycling is the most convenient and you know obviously the easiest for our consumers, but it's also the most challenging once it, all your recyclables are commingled together to separate and reuse those commodities are a challenge. And transporting um, glass far away because of its weight is also a challenge and very expensive. So that's really been all the issues that have kept glass from really getting repurposed uh, to higher levels. In the concrete industry, you've all probably been talking about a lot. Nationally, we use well over 100 million tons. I think the last recorded number is about 120 million tons or so of cement um, uh, consumed in the U.S., um, while cement only makes up 10 to 15 percent by mass of a, the footprint of concrete, it's about 80 percent of the um, uh, the carbon footprint. So that's what you want to attack uh, and replace to get that carbon footprint of concrete down. Hard surfaces, as you know, and darker surfaces add to heat island effect in our urban areas. The lighter, the brighter you can make it, the more you can offset that. And we'll talk about this product does as well in that regard. Uh, Poslons, uh, again, they're in short supply. The two historic Poslons have been post-industrial. They've been fly ash or slag. Fly ash coming out of coal burning power plants. As you know, we're shutting them down and converting them to gas fired plants. Slag coming out of the production of steel. Uh, as we upgrade steel manufacturing to electric arc furnaces, there's less usable slag being made available. So just when you've got a growing strong demand for these kind of elements to reduce the carbon footprint, um, of concrete, albeit with post-industrial material, the supply of the two of them have been going down. And that's the opportunity for glass to come in and maybe be, be the third leg of that stool. Uh, and this kind of captures really our story a little bit. You know, we like we like to say think planet performance with positive uh, for all of these reasons. One, it's got a carbon footprint that's only about 5% of the cement that it's replacing. So it's almost a ton for ton savings uh, for every ton of cement that can be replaced with a ground glass Poslon. It can use any color, any size glass. Well, the challenge to go back to bottles is that you've got a color separated. You can only do that to a certain size and you have to get ceramics and porcelains out. Uh, ceramics and porcelains, as you may know, have a different melting temperature when you try to send them back to uh, bottle manufacturing. Uh, it causes chaos in the furnaces. Uh, the fact that they are pozzolanic and we are not melting, we are just cleaning and grinding, allows us to keep those in the mix. Uh, and uh, and again, we can use any color at any size. So really no glass has to go to waste in our process. It reduces heat island effect by making a lighter concrete. I'll show you a photo in a second. Uh, creates a much stronger, um, uh, better performing concrete. Reduces shrinkage, uh, minimizes freeze thaw, 
It continues to gain strength there through, through 90 days. Um, the thing that's got the DOTs around our country excited is its ability to block chloride, uh, basically salt penetration in concrete, which causes early failure in concrete. It's five times more impactful than a straight cement mix uh, in doing so better than fly, fly ash and better than slag. Uh, and it's safe. It's free of any crystalline silica, uh, which is a carcinogen, and it's also free of any heavy metals that you find in certain other um, SCMs. We think it's a great circular story to tell. Uh, we're taking local glass. Uh, I wish that first photograph is what we get, be that clean, but that's what you put in your recycling bin. When it goes to a material recovery facility and gets co-mingled and separated, that's what we get, and that's what is being called glass delivered to us. And that's the challenge, the paper, uh, plastic, metals, cardboards that remain in there. Our job is to clean that to a very high standard, 99.5% or better purity, to mill it to that fine powder you see, and then put it back in the communities from which it came. That photograph on the right is New Canaan Library. So local Connecticut glass process in Connecticut, um, given to a local ready mix company here, and then back into a project uh, from the community from which it came. We can replace, uh, we've done testing to replace up to 50% uh, of cement and concrete. The commercial use typically is probably more in the 25 to 40% uh, as we're seeing today. This is kind of an interesting chart given to us by the uh, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, showing how much more, from a climate perspective, how impactful putting glass into concrete is over back to bottles of fiberglass. In large part, as I mentioned before, you've got to melt the glass to go back to bottles or fiberglass. Recycled glass is a slightly lower temperature, but you still have to melt it. And so a lot of energy is used, at, you know, and basically about a sixth of a ton less is what the uh, the industry will say they're saving by using recycled glass to go back into bottles, whereas it's almost ton for ton when you put it into concrete. Then the, the kind of knee-jerk response is yes, but you could only put it in concrete once every 25 or 50 years, and you can keep putting back into bottles, you know, over and over again. And we'll just say, you know, just keep looking at each each decision. Make a bottle and make a decision. Do you go back and, and make a, a, a new bottle or put it in concrete? Do it as many times as you want. Do six cycles of recycling and make those decisions. At the end of six cycles, you'll save a ton by putting it back into bottles. Make virgin material six times, put it into concrete, you'll save almost six tons of CO2. So from a climate perspective, by far the best thing you can do with glass is to put it into concrete because of the big carbon footprint of the cement in, in, the, in that concrete. Uh, this visual, I think, gives you a sense of what it does to, to lighten and brighten uh, cement. This is a two full blocks in New York City uh, sidewalks we did with New York City DOT. There's a pilot pour, the bottom 20% glass replacement, the middle of 30% fly ash replacement, and the top of 40% glass replacement. You can see how bright and white it made that, uh, that top panel. Um, and and it, just, it just helps reduce heat island effect by making it brighter and lighter. Uh, it also creates cooler roof white tops um, for, for floors and building surfaces, uh, lowering energy use um, for cooling and lighting as a result. We've been using it in a wide range of applications. Um, we're probably now well over uh, you know, a quarter of a million quarter cubic yards of cast in place concrete um, uh, in a wide range of projects. So we'll talk a little bit more about those also probably well over 12 million architectural block, brick, structural block as well, and brick um, uh, shipped as far as Vancouver, but mostly used around the greater, you know, in the Northeast and New York metropolitan area. Half a million square feet of pre-stressed concrete plank. We've, bought, we've built affordable housing projects, 12 stories plus, all with structural block and plank made with positive inside um, uh, and pavers uh, as well. Kind of a local, kind of a great uh, local story, local glass back to local low carbon projects, a high end food store uh, here in Westchester, uh, made primarily with glass from Westchester County. Um, the new Canaan Library we talked about, the uh, bottom right is the Western new Western headquarters of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's new building won two national awards because of the use of positive in it. Um, Oxford School, again, all projects done with uh, um, 
uh, positive in the, in the concrete. Some of the maybe more our more exciting uh, projects we like to talk about are flagship projects with with uh, positive in it. UN Plaza was an early one. We took the window glass out of the General Assembly building when it was being uh, renovated, uh, processed it into positive, gave it to Unilock Pavers, and it sits inside those pavers right outside the project from which it came. So a great circular story right within the, the project itself. It's in all the blocks of uh, New York uh, Second Avenue subway system that recently was completed. Uh, our probably highest profile project right now is a 2.2 million square foot J.P. Morgan Chase headquarters building that's under construction of Park Avenue. 40% replacement of the cement in that concrete in all the concrete uh, floor slabs are done with uh, with positive. Uh, and if we talked a little bit about the Hallett's Point project on the right there, uh, the first project of its kind to use it in structural elements. Uh, we're shipping it right now from our Connecticut plants. Oops, what happened there? there oops, there we go. Um, Shipping it um, uh, from our Connecticut plant uh, right now down to DC for a couple of uh, uh, high rise projects. This is a, a 900 uh, a unit high rise project um, uh, in, in DC. This is a ternary blend, 50% um, cement, 25% positive, 25% slag. Uh, well, lots of good ways to contribute. Um, from both a lead and an envision point of view, from materials, energy, emissions, resilience. It's a locally harvested post-consumer product versus a post-industrial product. Uh, so it, you know, it's it, it's a it's a great piece of the puzzle. Uh, at City Point uh, Plaza on the right, uh, that's the project that was done with the pre-cast pre-stressed uh, pre plank throughout the entire tower with positive in it. And just in, in closing, you know why. Why consider ground glass positives now? Then what can you do? Uh, clearly, the, the 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 testing is there. The, the the performance is there. We've because of the work we did with the pilot uh, mill years ago, and now with the new mill, we've got it in broad use. So uh, lots of real life uh, uh, use of the material. We've we've proven we can deliver it on a commercial scale. Uh, the ongoing urgency that you all know about to reduce the carbon footprint of concrete is making demand for this uh, even more urgent. Uh, the big thing that's happened in the last few years, we spent, uh, it took us four years to get a new ASTM standard in place, C1866, which is specific uh, 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 to govern the use of uh, ground glass uh, poslons in concrete. So that made it a lot easier for you all as architects and engineers to specify the material with guidance from ASTM. We talked about the diminishing supply of fly ash and slag, and the impact on pricing that, that that's having. Uh, the numbers that someone mentioned to me about the cost of fly ash uh, in in Hawaii is staggering, and and uh, I think it's you know reflective. Uh, maybe maybe it's one of the higher points in the country, but it's reflective of what's happening as as those commodities continue to be in demand and diminish in supply. Um, we talked about the uh, it's, it's, uh, the health and equity benefits again, reducing heat out effect while avoiding heavy metals, uh, and being able to. Uh, contribute to Envision and Lead. I think all help tell the story. What can you do? We tell us everybody in the communities we talk to, keep track of your glass, obviously in the streams. Um, you know, don't let it go to landfill as best you can. I know there's some challenges right now. Glass is being shipped uh, off island uh, back to California. I specify it, obviously we're not there yet, but hope we can be there at some point uh, um, uh, to, in your low carbon high performance concrete projects. It builds a better bit, a project. Uh, it uses, it's a great home for waste glass, uh, reduces that carbon footprint. And again, and it extends the life because of its ability uh, to block uh, uh, chloride. Uh, it extends the life of concrete as well. So that's a quick summary of who we are, what we're doing. This is our mill here, um, our plant, some of it anyway, uh, on the left. If any of you have reason to be traveling to Connecticut, we'd be delighted to show it to you. Uh, the material is... Um, Process in our mills, it's stored in, in silos and moves out in bulk uh, tankers, very much like fly ash or slag or uh, uh, cement would be. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's being used uh, every day right now. Our partner in our Connecticut plant is Connecticut's largest ready mix company, a company called ONG Industries. They've got it in five of their ready mix plants now. 
so day in, day out, uh, we're now using it. I'm very excited about it. Look forward to trying to expand it more. Um, we're not uh, yet in Hawaii, but as I'm learning more about it, it's an intriguing market, maybe as a potential down the road. So appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about this and uh, you know, make myself available for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, we are going to have some Q and A. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, if you could join me up here. So Matt Klein, sadly, uh, who was um, in in the um, manufacturer world. Uh, became ill and is no longer, it's not able to moderate. So I am uh, pinch hitting. Yeah. See if I'm trying to, I yes. Um, I don't think I saw any chats come in yet, but if you want to um, talk to your laptop. There's a four. I, I, was, I was also there. Oh. Okay. Um, um, well, I'm wondering, can- Or someone else wants to? Does someone want to uh, just grab the laptop and uh, hold on to it and be the, the question, yeah, so for those online, please send your questions to the chat and um, we'll make sure they get answered. Um, so for both of you, I'll start with you, Paul. Um, what would it take to get into the Hawaiian market to, to get a blocker, uh, the trailer? 4,000 square feet of land, uh, 440 voltage. Uh, 4,000 square feet of land, 440 voltage, and city and county water. Um, that would be the basics to get started. Uh, once we're ready to roll, we would take care of the diversion of plastic waste to the facility, and we would take care of hiring the employees to run the facility and uh, the distribution and uh, the sales of the box. And then obviously, the, we would share in that with uh, the owner of the facility and, and also um, There'd be probably discounts of those bringing us their waste. It'd be cheaper for us to, for them to bring us plastic waste and dispose of it. Yes. How much plastics did you say? Thirty tons a month is the minimum for a blocking system to set up and run, and that would, and that, yeah, that's the bare minimum. Thirty tons. You have to share this. Uh, do you know how much a Wahoo produces per month? Yes. As far as plastic waste, no, I don't, but I, I want to say it's probably over 100 times. Okay. I mean, so, when you look at Waikiki alone and Hilton Hawaiian Village is the largest Hilton property in the world, just them alone probably is doing 30 tons in a month. Okay, so, so feedstock is not an issue. So you're looking for an investor to buy the lot uh, or to rent you the lot? That or it would be that or um, the city and county because they have the most to gain or lose in this is the city and county. I mean, they run Opala, they run H Power. Um, they're the guys that are, you know, they have to deal with, you know, uh, no longer having AES and things like that out of Kapolei. It behooves the city and county the most to get into this business with us. Are there barriers? So it seems like a really elegant solution. Um, what barriers are you encountering, if any? Or is it just where this is, the product is being developed and it's just where it is in its development cycle? Right now, it's really just dollars and cents as far as we're looking for capital investors. Uh, we're started in on something with JP Morgan where they have a new uh, invest in the future environment type program. So we're working with them, but um, basically the capital to start making, going out and booking blocking systems and the capital to make those machines is pretty expensive. So that's what kind of we're looking at. It was, it was too big a jump to grow internally by just making blocks with the limited amount of system we have and make enough blocks to sell enough to invest in yourself and grow the company that way. It was easier to go out and market the technology and get capital investment that way, make it happen. Okay, so you're waiting for money. Waiting for money. And interest from Opala? 
Uh, yes, there is definitely interest from the uh, county. Honolulu and Opala is definitely interested here, as is the county of Kauai. So um, I don't think Kauai has the plastic waste we would need, but uh, definitely it's available. Uh, Patrick, kind of the same question to you. What would it take to get positive into this market? Um, well, I will kind of tell you the big variables that we look at and we'd have to just, we need to do a little more work together to kind of, um, to sort that out. Our, you know, our, our growth to date has been to try to expand on the East Coast, jump over to the West and then begin to fill another market. So we need to spend a little more time understanding um, the, uh, the the glass dynamics and other dynamics in the market, but the, the big variables that go into the mix, obviously. Uh, the amount of glass that's available, the condition of it, and the economics. It's, you know, right now it's, uh, as, as I think we've all talked about right now, a good chunk of it's being shipped, or being barged to the West Coast. Uh, I'm assuming some of it is probably still being lost on the island there elsewhere. So it's really the the volume, the, the, the volume of the glass available, the economics of that glass, the condition of it, the more trash in it, the less valuable it is, and we've got to dispose of the trash, which is a variable cost. And that's just, you know, again, what are the, the costs of trash uh, on the island? The other big variable is power. And my understanding is why it's pretty expensive power-wise. Uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts, where we are now, are probably tied for first place on the mainland. So it's a sensitive issue to us to make sure, um, you know, power is cost-effective. Um, I think the other comment was powered needs, you know, ours are probably more in the range of about uh, 4,000 amp service uh, to be brought in because of the mills and the like, even though it's got a significant, very small footprint relative to the cement it's replacing, it still has power needs to run the plant. Um, from a real estate perspective, you know, we probably need a footprint that's a few acres and we probably need, depending on the plant, 30, 40, 50,000 foot building probably to put it in. Uh, labor costs obviously go in as a variable. Uh, and then the fundamentals at the back end, right? The commodity prices on a given day for cement, fly ash, and slag. On my understanding, I guess the market's maybe more of a cement and, and fly ash market, maybe less slag. Um, no but slag. Sorry? No slag. S slag is interesting. There is slag. Okay. Okay. No, there, so, is a... there is not. Okay. That's what I thought. There's not. So it's really fly ash and cement. Um, yeah. So, you know, and I, from what uh, Jill, you had mentioned to me in one of your notes, it looks like those prices are, are you know, there are pretty big premiums on the island, which maybe help the economics because depending on all of those variables, right, drives the, the decision how small a plant could be or how big it has to be to be economically viable. So all of those things are, to answer your question, go in the mix. Uh, we have to date been looking, our first plant is in the range to give you orders of magnitude about 50,000 tons here in Connecticut. That's it's, what it's designed to do. The next generation plants, we're trying to be bigger than that, maybe 75 to 100. But again, as we become more efficient with the model and these economics of both glass on the back end and the finished product on the, uh, on the end, at, at, as the end product um, all come into play, we may be able to drive that that model down to a smaller size uh, plant. So those are the, all the things that go in. I'm sorry for a long-winded answer, but it's the, the, those are the things that kind of drive a market-by-market -market decision to try to make this work. Thank you. Um, back to you, Paul. Uh, you had talked about different models, um, direct to consumer, to contractors. Um, what is your sweet spot? Like, what is your focus? What, what do you think will really make the business viable? It's going to be the volume business. So I think if we can do, uh, get some infrastructure projects where we're doing sound walls or we're doing, you know, perimeter wall around communities, you know, much like they have in Mililani and some of the communities around there where they have a large block wall. I mean, that way we're, you know, it's a perfect place for it. You know, instead of the masonry and, and the cement and the carbon footprint that goes into that wall, diverting all that plastic waste and keeping it here and making it look the exact same. I think that's that's where we, you know, doing infrastructure and doing county projects is going to get the volume, get it really rolling. And then I think what you're going to see is if we start, we get it into retail where it's on an end cap where somebody comes in and sees it, a block like this sitting there and they go, Oh, I can build an ADU in my house, you know, in my backyard with this. Oh, I can build a bench 
and put some siding on it and make something kind of cool. You know, I think you're going to see that kind of spur it from the DIY side on the, that, along with you know people like myself driving the commercial and the civil. Patrick, from your um, presumably, if to to make the investment to come out here, there would have to be some sort of agreements with the ready mix suppliers. How does something? How do you even enter a market with a new uh, SEM? Can I help that? Sorry. I think here with the footprint he needs and the power he needs to do positive here in Hawaii. You'd have to look at one of the big threes, you know, it's with Castle and Cook, Alexander and Baldwin, Kamehameha Schools. Those are the guys that got the land. Those are the guys that got the money because the state and the counties aren't going to be able to do it. Uh, when you look at the ready mix suppliers here, the two major ones, HCD, Amaron, you know, Mainland Controlled, and then Hawaiian Cement, and Hawaiian Cement's owned by Knife River. So if you have any relationships with Knife River, that would be where you start in into Hawaii with the ready mix. But as far as Having a plant, having a footprint, it's up to the one of the big three because they have the money. They have the money and they have the land. Well, again, maybe I could add to that a little bit. Um, one, I, I'm less concerned actually about the the end user because I think the demand is is strong there, and and every market we've looked at, I think there's very strong interest on the on the end user market. I think on the uh, I think the issues are the the glass, the feedstock. If you don't have the feedstock, you can't run the business. So I think it's really understanding and really the you know the 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 glass dynamics who's controlling the glass the economics and the the volumes there i i, I mean i not to dismiss in any way the importance of the end users and and in connecticut for example our partner is a ready mix partner so it gave us a lot of credibility particularly with the first plant i think with that under a belt now uh in the performance we have it, i think we feel a lot more comfortable uh, uh on the uh, on the on the back end on the capital side, you know, again, if the economics makes sense, it's a pretty broad climate market, climate investment market right now for people, whether it's ready mix companies, cement companies, but the, the, the climate invest, the climate fund market right now is a pretty broad market. And uh, I, I think we'd, you know, be able to get it done if the, the economics made sense to be there. Is there enough post consumer glass here? Are you, is that for me? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, market, we have well, you know, it's a funny market because I, I just need to. It's a it's a different market than most you know of America because your population of give or take I think one point four million. Yet you have you know annual visitors of ten million. So it's a you know I, we really need to understand the impact of that visitor market and the glass volumes uh, that are generated uh, in, in your local market, which are a little different than you know the typical rule of thumb of seventy five pounds of glass per person or something. You know, in a normalized market, um, I think my my the last time we looked at the market uh, a few years ago with a little bit of work, our sense was give or take twenty thousand tons of glass was being shipped off uh, to the mainland uh, for processing. Uh, I, I suspect there's a fair amount of that more still somewhere on the island, but those were the numbers I think I was hearing the last time we looked at that. Uh, by the way, if anybody uh, on this call has an interest in this idea and really would like to roll up their sleeves with us, we'd be delighted to kind of spend a little more time to kind of uh, assess this. Again, our, our focus has been really East Coast and then moving West, but no reason not to jump into an interesting market, you know, if, if the uh, uh, the story is there. I was curious, um, I think I saw in one of your slides, Paul, that uh, you can take any number of plastic, uh, and it doesn't need to be clean. Part of it's the shredding and the, the steaming. The shredding and the steaming of it cleans it up. So it actually gets, um, that's why we need the water and the, and the powers because it, uh, in the process, it's steaming all those pieces and then uh, kind of smashing them and molding them together when they're warm. And because one thing I had heard about those three through seven is if you're heating whatever your lasagna and your number five or whatever that it actually some of the food gets bonded to the plastic like that's how you end up with uh, um you know stains food stains um and that doesn't represent a problem i don't know we we're doing some separation of, of things like that but i mean it hasn't been a major stopping point for us 
what we've been producing. I mean, when you look at the blocks that are here, you can actually see wrappers from packaging and things like that. You know, right here it says fish something. Oh, it says fish, tilapia. You know, you can actually see packages right in the block. But I mean, it's pressed all smooth, so this is all like a smooth solid surface. All right, I think you guys have addressed the questions that I have made notes of. Are there any coming in from the chat? Yeah. Um, have you found any like resistance from, have you found any like resistance from structural engineers who maybe are less familiar with uh, product or system like this or more familiar with these, the more traditional masonry? And, and if so, um, how do you go about working with a structural engineer who um, might take some convincing to be uncomfortable specifying a, a you know, less traditional system like this? So I start with, have you done a post-tension system before? You know, because basically that's what we're doing. We're doing a freestanding, free free-stacking post-tension system. We've got a three-quarter inch rod in every other hole through this wall. With, with a nut at the top and a compression blade. So it's a pretty stout wall once it's all you know put together and anchored down. Also, these three quarter inch rods are coming out of the concrete and you probably have four to six inch embedment in those rods down in the, in the concrete as well. So you got your hole down there. So um, it's just a matter of if they're, on the, suddenly they go, oh, so it's just not a plastic block all stacked and glued together, right? Oh, it's a PT system. Oh, it's got three quarter inch rod. They feel much more comfortable to get to that point. Okay, and so the blocks are basically just creating mass. Yes. Uh, and there's no adhesive between them. And you need an air barrier on the outside and a finished system. No air barrier, just a finished system. You mean just a finished system, siding or what is going to be your furniture stuff. And is that for aesthetics or for fire resistance or for it's something else? It's increasing insulation, it's increasing the fire resistance, depending on what you're using, and uh, fire insulation and then aesthetics. Though there are some people that will like, they'll do a wall, but leave a window open, just showing a little bit of it, what's behind it. And then one of my designs that I've drawn up for like a lifeguard station, what I wanna do is, as far as our, our part of the life fusion and the give back is, once we get going here in Hawaii, what I'd like to do is build some lifeguard stations with this, showing, you know, put them right on the beach, showing where the plastic's coming out of and what can be done with it. And then we could actually put siding or put some kind of protective over it, but leave a couple clear plexiglass walls, just showing the plastic behind it and what's actually holding the lifeguard stations up in the air. Any issues with melting? Like solar gain enough to, to melt it? That's good. Like great garbage. Patch in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Well, see, Ocean Warrior is the one that goes out to the garbage patch and they uh -huh. pick up and they drop off their tonnage. They drop off the tonnage here in Honolulu, Ocean Warrior does when they go out. So basically their, their path is typically um, from California out this way, collect whatever they get. If they're full, drop it in Honolulu. If they're not, go further west, you know, to the patch and then go to Japan and drop it there. And then come from Japan back west, load up again, drop it in Honolulu, and then it gets shipped to the west coast and goes to Bifusion. Um, right now, we're using between six to eight percent of the marine waste with plastic waste. We'd like to get that content up, but it's just a matter of the quality and what's going to bond together with those different types of plastics. A uh, variation, uh, Patrick, of, of Scott's question about um, maybe reticence of engineers and or contractors in specifying positive and using positive. Have you, uh, you have all your, uh, you know, testing. Is that sort of it? Um, well, I mean, I, we, I wish it was that easy. It's taken us, you know, as I said, we had a pilot plant since 2009 and, and you know, we're glad we had that. Not only did we have a pilot plant, my, my family happened to own a block manufacturing plant that was trying to distinguish a gray generic block from everyone else's gray generic block. Uh, and to do that, we originally started focusing on recycled content. 
uh, which led us to the evolution of using glass uh, as a recycled content, which you know then led into the story about the low carbon footprint. But without that, I don't think we would have gotten this you know commercialized because of a very cautious, slow changing industry. The fact that we're able to put it in our own block and use it on some of those projects we mentioned before, uh, and then jump to some of these uh, cast in place projects that we've mentioned, and having the good fortune of having the likes of CCNY and the Durst organization, uh, Google did some testing with it, uh, Microsoft, uh, everyone else now, there, there is, uh, uh, I think, such good, sufficient support, the test data performance that it is much easier now, but but it is clearly, as those of you in the room know, it's a, a, when it comes to concrete, a very cautious, slow changing industry. It was the case when slag was introduced into the industry uh, and it was with us and it, it is continuing, but moving on a very good path. I mean, very positive, we're very excited about it, uh, but it is a very cautious, uh, slow to change industry. We're uh, Today I was up at uh, the Harvard campus, they're hopefully gonna use it in their first project to kind of see the Boston market. You mentioned a few projects down in uh, in DC. Uh, Microsoft actually paid to have three tanker trips shipped out to Phoenix from Connecticut is a pretty good drive because of you know their desire to use it. So all of those things have contributed uh, to make it uh, easier. Uh, so the more enlightened community, the development, the design, architectural community of those who focus on low carbon issues are really, I think, attracted to it. Those that are slower to come around are almost being forced to consider other alternatives because we talked about the issues with fly ash and slag uh, and cement prices as well. I mean, those of you that are looking at projects, you're you're seeing your, you know, your projects have got cement increases that could have been last year. There were probably, you know, at least two last year, at least stateside, and, and they're more coming, I think. So all of those issues are forcing those that are slow to change just from an economic point of view and availability of an SCM to look at alternatives. Hey, Patrick, I think, I think um, here in Hawaii, I think the ready mix plants are going to try to change faster just because we have a limited aggregate source. You know, we can only quarry so much. There's only so much island you can take rock out of, right? right. Um, we're importing fines. I mean, they cut us off from using beach sand and Maui dune sand, which was used throughout the state about five years ago. So we're importing sand from Vancouver. We import our fines. Um, our fly ash is eh, okay, but we really don't have that much from H power. And right. obviously we import our, our clink and our cement. So pretty much it's the whole ready mix industry is almost completely imported other than our aggregate. Yeah, no, and, and I think that all helps the story. No, thank you for, for adding to that. I think the other piece of the puzzle, Jill, to your question is uh, the, uh, the implementation of the C1866 ASTM standard goes a long way to give all of you in the room some comfort uh, in specifying the material as well, because there are clear guidelines, the cleanliness, the condition, the fineness of the material. Uh, it is a more difficult standard to meet than some of the natural Poslon standards because it was a new material being introduced. So there's comfort for all of you to know that there is a, a, a tight standard out there in using the material and its processing and, and production. So all of those things, uh, in addition to what Paul just added about what's happening on the island, um, you know, I think are helping uh, the cause significantly. How cost-wise in Connecticut, uh, how does it compare to cement? How's uh, the cost of positive uh, Well, our cement prices are, I mean, they're, they're, I thought they were expensive, but not as expensive as yours. They may be, you know, 145, 150 or something a ton. But uh, we're prior to pricing the material to be, uh, you know, competitive uh, in this market, even though we believe it's a better material I think just to continue to in introduce it uh, and, and get it on a commercial scale, we are pricingly competitive with those other commodities. Okay, cool. Um, we are approaching 6.30, anything uh, anything in the chat? Okay, well, um, thank you, Patrick, for staying up late for us. Really, uh, really fascinating stuff. And thank you, Paul, for taking the time to come over and join us in person. Thank you all for joining us in person and for those of you online. Um, yeah, uh, we hope you join us. Our next in the series is um, David Arkin from Arkin Tilt, a California architect who has uh, a lot of expertise with uh, 
uh, rammed earth and straw bale. So uh, investigating, you know, it doesn't get much more local than soil. Um, so we'll be checking that out uh, December 6th. Hope you can join us. Um, have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Good night.